Today on Inside the Issues, Besma Momani gives us an update on the Arab Spring. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. I'm David Welch, the CG Chair of Global Security at the Balsley School of International Affairs and Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo. Each week I welcome a guest into the studios here at the Center for International Governance Innovation in Waterloo, Ontario to speak about some important timely issue in global governance or international public policy. And this week, I'm pleased to welcome back for the third time, uh, Besma Mamani, our uh, local Middle Eastern specialist, associate professor of political science at the University of Waterloo and also a CG senior fellow. So welcome back. So you've been on twice already to talk very helpfully about uh, dynamics of the so-called Arab Spring, a mm -hmm. term that's gained currency but also become somewhat controversial. Maybe we can talk about that a bit later. Sure. Uh, but it's been almost a year now, and so yeah. perhaps it's a good time to step back and look at the past year in that part of the world and ask, uh, how's it going? Mm -hmm. What are the trends? What are the prospects? What are the surprises? Yeah. What's your general take on events in that part of the world at the moment? Well, it's interesting because you know it, we have had a little bit of time, so standing back is really uh, a great tool right now to kind of get an idea of sort of what are the determining factors of why this actually happened. And we seem to have um, some understanding that it was a perfect storm of several factors, uh, a lot of economic factors indeed. Uh, distribution of, of income is, is qu you know, quite wide in many of the countries that have been affected. Uh, but there are co countries that have been actually growing economically, which is quite striking. Mm -hmm. It takes away from you know, the mantra of all you need is growth. Well, it's not just about growth, it's about distribution. Uh, we know that Tunisia and Egypt were reporting fantastic growth rates uh, before the crisis, something to the effect of, of four to five percent GDP growth per year. Uh, a great, you know, very remarkable kinds of indicators. Similarly, Syria was doing really well. Uh, the one outlier in all of this is Yemen. Yemen's got, I think, a lot more particular kinds of dimensions. But at least those three cases, we can say, very much affected by this, you know, pattern of economic growth, no distribution, a lot of corruption, uh, which is underlying a lot of this, uh, an emerging middle class that feels very much alienated from the power structure, uh, not able to sort of surpass what is maybe a glass ceiling uh, imposed um, and given um, favoritism to crony capitalists, for example. So we, we see some simil similarities between the three cases where there's a lot of uh, upheaval right now. Uh, and very youthful populations, right? Yes. Although you know, that's a youth true across bulge. the region, isn't it? It's actually a phenomenon probably of every developing country that there's a youth yeah. bulge. Although in the Middle East, there is uh, an even more exceptional youth bulge. So absolutely, mm -hmm. that's a big part of it. You know, the demographics is really important here. Uh, but it's not enough because there are a lot of countries throughout the region that have a similar youth bulge that haven't had the same effect. So if we had to put our finger on sort of a key dynamic, it would be rising expectations that are being frustrated. Absolutely. Absolutely. High expectation and low delivery of opportunity mm -hmm. to those young people. Uh, that seems to be you know, a similar pattern. And so m many of these countries are actually even becoming you know, increasingly more educated. We're having more, going into the, you know, more uh, uh, people going into the middle class, uh, uh, higher rates of entrepreneurship. And interestingly, you know, unlike perhaps the sort of the neoliberal model that we've been uh, you know, getting as, as advice from many international financial institutions, uh, we're actually seeing a lot of competitiveness and growth starting, but there, again, it's, there's a limit there. Mm -hmm. So you can open up a business, doing business you know, uh, indicators are really strong in many of these countries, but the real problem is that they can't go further because they hit that ceiling that's filled of, of uh, uh, limitations of corruption and all the other sort of uh, dynamics of authoritarianism that, uh, that it brings with it. Right, now the narrative that we prefer in the West is that this is about democracy blooming. But all of a sudden it's frustrated people uh, trying to overthrow their uh, kleptocratic or uh, autocratic leaders. Yes. Uh, the story you just told me doesn't seem to fit that narrative especially well. So from your perspective, it's not necessarily about democracy. No, and, and you know, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, the, 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 the proof in the pudding is that, you know, there are a lot of authoritarian regimes in the Middle East. Uh, but many authoritarian regimes that have been better able to distribute that economic wealth are not finding nearly as much conflict, and the Gulf is probably the best example of that. I mean, there, you couldn't get a better case of authoritarianism uh, than you would find in the Gulf. But there is economic distribution there. Uh, there is an attempt to give people in the society an opportunity to participate in that society. There's more initiatives that try to encourage uh, uh, 
participation in, in the economy and participation in, in civic life. So it's not just authoritarianism per se. There is a stronger, I believe, economic dimension to the argument than just political. Right. And earlier when you were on, we were talking about the role of religion and its uh, apparent surprising absence mm -hmm. in the street protests, yes. particularly in Tunisia and in Egypt. Uh, what's your view now of the religious dimension of what's happening in that part of the world? Yeah, I mean, it's r quite fascinating, particularly when we see both in Nehda of, of Tunisia, uh, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood of Egypt, and the Nur Party, which are probably, um, you know, uh, new on the scene, but yeah, indeed they've taken the elections and the democracy uh, and, uh, to their own advantage and have gained quite a bit of, of power. Um, you know, I think that some of this is still couched in economic uh, reasoning, and that many of those parties are deemed to be uncorrupted, and this is really important. They don't represent the liberal elites of the past. And that's a lot of the worry with many of the secular parties in contrast. So the secularists were often viewed as part of, either complicit in some way or a, a part of the same uh, uh, circles of the secular elites that preceded them. Let's not forget that Ben Ali, uh, Mubarak, these were elites who preached that they were secularists. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is a packaging, unfortunately, in my opinion, that liberals and secularists are one. Oh, I see. And so going to religious parties is the alternative to that. And the liberals and the secularists, for example, in Egypt have had a very difficult time to explain to people that they are not the Mubaraks, right? But in the eyes of the masses, who particularly have been disenfranchised economically, particularly, uh, for so long, they view those elite as being part of right. the problem. The secularists and the liberals are one. They are basically the problem of the past. And let's give what is viewed as religious, honest men, most likely, uh, an opportunity to govern because maybe they will distribute that wealth. And I suppose to some extent, when you're looking for change, you're tempted by the biggest possible looking change. Absolutely. We'll be back again in a moment with Besma Mamani to talk about the Arab Spring you're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So let's talk about a couple of specific countries and starting with Syria. So okay. Syria has been in the news more than any other country in the region recently. Mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily a fast changing story, but a story that does seem to have some trends. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your read on the state of affairs in Syria and how long can the Assad regime hang on? Yeah, well, it's, it's really a sad, sad situation. Um, speaking to several people on the ground, uh, part of the opposition movement who I'm in contact with as well, uh, the situation is evolving and, you know, we you know, a few months ago when we, we talked, uh, there was uh, the situation where much of Aleppo and Damascus, the two centers of where there was, you know, much merchant, uh, that merchant class, uh, didn't really participate much in the demonstrations. We're starting to see more and more of them speak out against Assad. So there's a, already a beginning of that kind of dialogue. But the reality is much of the opposition is still outside of the city centers. Um, we can't forget that. But the merchants themselves are starting to get irritated with the situation. The economic sanctions are hurting, uh, especially the Arab League economic sanctions. The, you know, the Western economic sanctions weren't nearly as effective as when we had, for example, many of the Gulf countries uh, stop transfer payments, bank transfer payments. Now we're seeing it more difficult for exporters and importers, which is a really important point for um, a reference point here is that Syria is a hub in many ways to get goods and, and, and products throughout the region, particularly to Turkey, Iraq, and Jordan. That's all now stopped. So it's become a squeeze on that merchant class in Damascus and Aleppo, and they're starting to be affected by this and starting to talk about who can replace Assad, which is a conversation, at least at minimum, that I would say five, six months ago didn't exist. Nevertheless, he still has a lot of support. You know, this is something that we don't hear very much about uh, here in the West, but he has a lot of support in the country. Where does that support come from? Because he yeah. comes from a minority group. He's Alawite mm -hmm. and a uh, different religion than most of the rest of the country. Yeah. How is it that he has broad-based support. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it may not be a love of him per se. I would say the support comes from the fear of the unknown. And there are so many individuals there that have swallowed the propaganda pill, if you will, that 
this will become Iraq. That if you had intervention, if you had the removal of the regime, you get rid of the, the center structure, we will end up in a sectarian war. And that really resonates with people in Syria because at least under Assad, people didn't ask whether you were Alawite, Sunni, or Shia, it was, or Christian. I mean, it was just not a conversation piece. But people are seeing that actually now in, in, a, in a, you know, the rest of the city of Hama, for example, where there is a lot of these kind of cleavages existing, there is a lot of that kind of retaliation attacks back and forth. In other words, a Sunni doctor is killed, there's suddenly a Shia doctor killed the day, next, you know, the day after. And that's starting to make people think, mm. oh no, we don't, we can't afford another Iraq scenario. And the Iraqi scenario is truly being something that's internalized throughout the country to make people say, Assad is better than that. And I suppose they've also had the experience of watching Lebanon degenerate into sectarian war on their let's not western flank. Absolutely. And let's not forget that there's a lot of family ties right. between Lebanon and Syria. And so people have family members who have been through 16 years of civil war exactly where the sectarianism mm -hmm. existed. So it's not even far, you know, too far off removed from their own you know, right. realities. But we are still beginning to see some soldiers beginning to break ranks, mount attacks on... Syrian army units, uh, very interesting mm -hmm. attack on an elite squad of Syrian yes. Air Force pilots not long ago. Really quite brazen. Absolutely. What do you think is in the minds of Syrian soldiers who are now mm -hmm. all of a sudden deciding that they, they can't do this anymore and they're going to start fighting for the other side? Yeah, so at the moment we have some estimates are between 20 and 30,000 defectors who have basically uh, set up camp in, in southern part of Turkey. Um, you know, I think that at the moment the Free Syrian Army, which is what they've called themselves, they're still pretty low-level rank. A lot of them are conscripts. Uh, they're not the generals. They're not the commanders. Uh, and they're actually be on the ones on the front lines. In fact, there is, you know, a policy that seems to find out now through the, f through the defectors to take the Sunni conscripts and put them at the front of the line. And, and basically, the, the, the Alawites at the back of the line and say, you know, you do the shooting, Sunni versus Sunni, and if you don't, we're going to shoot you from behind. So it, very much terrorizing many of these conscripts, and, and we're seeing defections increase by the day, absolutely. But there's still, you know, the, the problem of this is a small group. It still is pale in comparison to the million-plus uh, uh, conscripts that are in the army right now, either as reserves or full-time. And more importantly, uh, it's about armaments. You know, we're still talking about uh, at the most, they have, you know, um, um, you know, sh fire, sh shoulder, um, shoulder fired uh, missiles, and, missiles and, and so you on. You know, that's about the most that they have. They don't really have tanks. They don't have the kind of firepower mm -hmm. needed to really take on the Syrian army. I mean, we just saw, for example, uh, a huge shipment of both Chinese and Russian arms go into uh, into Syria, and we saw the Syrians show off their their weaponry about two weeks ago. As a result, I mean. This still says that there's a lot of, 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 a, of weaponry cachet in their, in their uh, arsenal, and they will use it against uh, uh, the Free Syrian Army. So I'm not convinced that it's enough. Um, however, you know, if the Turks become involved, which is increasingly something that the Syrians are afraid of, you know, they've dismissed the fear of having NATO get involved. I mean, we all know that uh, I think the Americans and the Europeans who comprise most of the a contribution to NATO are are done with intervening. Uh, they've exhausted, you know, Libya took a lot longer than they expected it to. We have obviously a fiscal situation in most of these countries that don't allow them to really start, you know, spending money on liberating other people at the mm -hmm. moment when they have such trouble at home. So we're going to have to see, I think, this carried out regionally. And Turkey is the country that the Syrians are most afraid of, i.e. that the Turks will actually start funding and arming the Free Syrian Army to carry out raids. And so it's not, uh, it's not a surprise then that we hear already from the Turks a call for some sort of no-fly zone protection, which doesn't make sense because, you know, in, in many ways, the, the Syrian Army are not using planes. Right. You know, they're not, you know, they're not it's, challenging it's the armor. people. It's about giving them a cover so that the, the, uh, the Free Syrian Army can carry out attacks without having then the Syrian army trying to attack the Free Syrian army from the north. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's another development. It's uh, a cause, I think, for everybody to, to look into. It is still a cause of concern, I think, even for us here in Canada, because we all know NATO, uh, Turkey is a member of NATO, and with a collective security principle, 
it's not something that you know should escape us uh, completely. We right. should be concerned about uh, Turkish intervention as That's well. Right. Okay, well, we'll continue again in a moment with Besma Bamani. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. Uh, one more thing about Syria that uh, I'm really curious about, and that is, is anybody thinking about what a post-Assad Syria might look like? Mm -hmm. Is there any planning? any scheming? Is anybody backing any particular horses? We're certainly right. not hearing much about this in the press. No, we're not. And partly it, it's the fact that the Syrian opposition is divided. So here it is. We have what are the youth that are carrying out the actual demonstrations. So the protesters in Hama and Homs and other places. It's the local coordination committee, the LCC, that are basically the umbrella of unknown activists, literally, we don't know their names. Uh, I mean, they're known to the, the Syrian opposition, but they don't actually publicize their names. They're carrying out these, uh, you know, very um, organized protest movement. And, and let's not think that they're all, they're very organized and meticulous. There's a plan, how to get the video out, you know, mostly to Beirut, uh, very tech savvy uh, organization behind the LCC. Then you have the Syrian opposition that's inside the country. And they're mostly intellectuals, uh, a lot of university professors, writers, poets, etc. Much of this group, which has publicized its names, are not dare saying the word overthrow or regime change. They're talking about dialogue. Okay? So the Syrian opposition inside is talking about dialogue. Then you have the Free Syrian Army, right, as we talked about earlier, which believe that military action is the only way to end. Both the local coordination committee and the Syrian opposition oppose the tactics of the Free Syrian Army. So there's already a division between those two camps and, and have been very blatant. The LCC, for example, um, disagreed with the Free Syrian Army and many sort of their tactics and said, look, you're not helping us. We don't want you to take this to a military level. We want this to be very much, you know, sort of uh, a peaceful pro uh, protest. This is the way we're doing it. This is the way it worked in all other countries. Uh, we want the Egyptian model. We don't want the Libyan model. Then you have those on the outside. So in the Syrian diaspora, we have two groups. Um, they call themselves the Syrian National Council, but they're divided among secularists and what I'd say the religious. The religious parties have set up an office in Istanbul, um, and they are influenced very much by a Muslim Brotherhood ideology, if you will, uh, for lack of a better term. Now remember, much of those who are living in Istanbul even escaped from the times of when uh, Hama was destroyed by Bashar al-Assad's father, mm -hmm. uh, where he rooted out a lot of these Muslim Brotherhood activists. So they have their base in, um, in Istanbul. There's groups in London and Berlin that are more on the secular liberal side, and they are organizing amongst themselves. There's a long list of individuals, intellectuals, who have been in the diaspora, some who have left Syria more recently to become active on the outside. And they're trying now very, uh, very hard to centralize a message. Um, they agreed amongst themselves to keep their, their head office in Istanbul. They've been given a lot of support and equipment by the Turks. In fact, uh, the Turks are even supporting them and teaching them sort of media training, how mm. to get their message out. And they um, are also very apprehensive about the Free Syrian Army. Mm -hmm. So the Free Syrian Army are acting in many ways in a very renegade situation. Literally where, free Syrian Army. They literally are very free and don't seem to get the support of the SNC on the outside. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there isn't enough, you know, there, there is talk about who will replace Assad finally happening in a lot of the Damascus and, and Aleppo salons, if you will, you know, the, the sort of living rooms of people. But not, there's no uh, identifiable leader, uh, I would say, at the moment. The SNC has a professor from Sorbonne who is their official leader, uh, but he's not someone that's being touted as a replacement uh, for, for the president, mm. uh, Assad. So that leaves things obviously a little more murky and a lot more divided. No, interestingly, that's been the pattern everywhere, right? So there wasn't an obvious leader in Tunisia to replace yes. Ben Ali. There wasn't an obvious leader in Egypt to replace Mubarak. There wasn't an obvious leader Absolutely. in Libya to replace Gaddafi. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it would be easier if there were Iran 1979, right? There's mm -hmm. the Ayatollah Khomeini is there in Paris, ready, willing, and able to come right. in when the Shah flees, right? Right. S so it's possible that, in some respects, a transition uh, to a post-Assad world in Syria might resemble some of those other countries. 
but it couldn't exactly resemble Egypt, right? Because mm -hmm. in Egypt, even though nobody had sort of planned a succession, the army was the caretaker in That's fact. right. And now I imagine in Syria that can't happen. No. Because the army is complicit in the Absolutely. repression. Absolutely. So what do you have? Just chaos and disorder? Well, you know, people are in Syria, uh, at least the Free Syrian Army interpretation is that this is the, for them the model is Libya, right? Uh, and even the SNC, the Syrian National Council, is taking a lot of lessons from the Libyan National Council. It's interesting, the Libyan National Council, or now is de facto the, the government of Libya, have already officially recognized the, the Syrian National Council mm. as the official government of Syria. Interesting. So they're getting a lot of support from them as well. And, and they're, you know, they're trying to marry that kind of situation, but understanding that they will likely not get the NATO support that they want, as they did in Libya. What about the Arab League? The Arab League was actually important in Libya. Yeah. Are they trying to take a leading role in shaping things in Syria? Very much, very Who much. Who do they back? Um, they're very much in support of the Syrian National Council. Uh, and we saw particularly Qatar and Saudi Arabia uh, invest a lot into trying to support the SNC. The problem remains for them is that this is, you know, in the shadow of a larger regional problem, and that's with Iran. So what the Saudis and the Qataris, for all their efforts in wanting to support the SNC, also are trying to balance out the need of not antagonizing Iran, because antagonizing Iran is more dangerous to them mm -hmm. than Bashar al-Assad. Right. So it's a really important playing uh, thing. But you know, the interesting thing of the Arab League is that they have become emboldened like no other time in their history. Uh, they actually, for the very first time, you know, whether it was in Libya, of removing a member, uh, suspending membership of another, uh, telling uh, uh, Syria that they will put through an economic sanction, which they've done. I mean, that's all a first time for the Arab League. I mean, before it was pretty much a sham. So this is really interesting. And it, it's Particularly since they're largely authoritarian states, the Arab Absolutely. League. Absolutely. So they're, yeah. in one sense, writing their own death certificate, aren't they? Well, that's really interesting because, you know, much of this is Qatar's lead at the Arab yeah. League. And, you know, the difference I think here is, is if we view this in terms of just authoritarianism and democracy, then it, it becomes inconsistent. Mm -hmm. But if we look at it in the lens of, well, it's about economic justice, it's about, you know, not uh, butchering your people, I mean, all of that, then the Qataris and the Saudis right. believe that they're on the right side Effective of history. Effective social order. Absolutely. We'll be back one more time with Pesma Mamani. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So we've had a little time now also to reflect on some of the countries that have done the transition from mm -hmm. authoritarian rule, and the most interesting one at the moment still is Egypt, of course. Uh, first experience with elections. Yes. Uh, were you surprised by the dynamics of those elections and by the results? Very surprised. And I think that we're all surprised about one party, and that's the success of a newer party, which is the Salafist fundamentalist group. We all expected the Muslim Brotherhood to do well, but the Salafists taking 24% is extremely shocking. Um, and I think it, you know, there is some now we've had a time to sort of reflect on this a little bit. And what we're hearing from people is this idea of, well, let's give them a chance. Let's give that maybe the newer party will be clean. Maybe they won't be corrupt. Maybe they will actually, uh, you know, distribute some of the wealth in the country. And there's a, sort of an anti-liberal sentiment there too. And you see that even in the past, you know, the week before the elections where all the liberals returned to Tahrir Square. I mean, the sort of argument was, well, great, they got on a bus from the American University of Cairo and brought their, their iPads to the Tahrir Square, but the rest of us had to continue schlepping it and working. Uh, those are the ones that voted for El Noor. So there's a lot of anti-liberal sentiment actually, ironically, built up the week before the election that actually pushed them towards the El Noor party. Which, again, you know, it's a, it's a shock in many ways because the country isn't fundamentalist in many ways. I mean, the Muslim Brotherhood is definitely more uh, of a mainstream Islamist party, and we're not surprised on them getting, you know, 30, 40 percent of the vote. That was expected. But why? You know, why did presumably a lot of that Muslim Brotherhood vote go toward uh, the Salafists? It was really quite shocking. So you think Elnur took votes from the Muslim Brotherhood? I do. Even if it was stimulated by an anti-liberal, anti-democratic sentiment? And partly too, I mean, you know, in the past five months uh, before the vote, the Muslim Brotherhood did a lot to appeal to the liberal voter, hmm. right? So they also ideologically moved their points of reference 
increasingly toward the center. And I think that there were people there who didn't see them as an alternative by the time elections came around and start to think of the Salafists as being the true non-Mubarak regime. Now, if you're a Western country and what you really want to avoid is something like Iran, mm -hmm. and you want a, a government in Egypt that you can do business with and that will also continue to play ball with Israel in some muted way at least, what yeah. do you want to see? Do you want to see this sort of split Islamic vote where, where El Noor and Muslim Brotherhood are sort of sharing that side of the political spectrum? Yeah. Do you want to see El Noor triumph because they're plainer I, dealers and, right. and more honest brokers? Well, I think what we're going to see, you know, there seems to be some sort of tacit agreement here whereby the parliament will be focused on domestic policies only. We're not going to see, the president will be in charge of external relations. Uh, we're going to see, for example, I think uh, the military intervene to make sure that the president that comes forward is a liberal. That again, mm. is the face of Egypt that will be more accommodating you know, to its pro-Western bent. And you think Egyptians as a whole will swallow that? I think they will, because the Muslim Brotherhood refused to put forward a candidate, right? They've already said they'll not put forward a candidate from their list. Um, the Salafists do not have anyone of that kind of caliber that could compete for the president position. So it leaves it uh, to what are generally populist kind of liberals maybe not uh, you know, outwardly secularist as much as someone like Mohammed al-Baradai, but maybe someone like Amr Musa, who is sort of a, a more uh, you know, centrist kind of candidate. That will probably be the face of the, of, of, of the country. And I think they're going to be the ones dealing with foreign relations. And that seems to be the, the, what the military has tried to convey post-election had actually a news conference with reporters, only foreign reporters, to basically get that message out. That, you know, in no other terms, they're not going to allow a Salafist to become president. Right? And would that president then be hamstrung by having to deal with a parliament that he or she couldn't work with effectively? I think that's why part of the negotiations will come at the time of writing the Constitution and allowing the president a lot more power away mm -hmm. from that. In other words, give the parliament the domestic capacity which I think is actually a very good thing. You know, already we're starting to see after the, the Salafists have taken power in some areas, you know, there are these, you know, town hall meetings where they're talking about we need to ban alcohol, we need to ban, you know, we need to make women wear their scarves. You've already seen a reaction in this one week after saying, wait a minute, how is that going to give me water? Mm -hmm. Like, why are we focusing on the fact that people shouldn't be drinking alcohol in the country when we don't have clean water? So already the pressure on the Salafists to provide is there. And I think, you know, unless they come up with ideas, and they haven't had any ideas on economic challenges, they're not going to do well the next time around. And, and you've diffused, I think, a really important, you know, potential fundamentalist movement from gaining power. So as long as we, we have to ensure a few things, I think, from Western interests, one, that there is a president that is, you know, amenable, that the military continues to have it control over foreign policy concerns, in other words, that it takes on a passive approach with its neighbors, and more importantly, you don't have um, a, um, um, a parliament that can intervene in international affairs, and that there's a second round of voting. In other words, that in four years we have the next vote. I mean, that's be the crucial thing. If right. you sort of, you know, upset the dynamics now, uh, that'll give the Salafists even more power like we saw in Algeria, where it's denied a chance to govern. No, give them a chance to govern. They have the domestic sphere. They've inherited a very difficult challenge. 80 million people, 40% of the population illiterate. How are you going to fix things? And it's not enough to just go to fundamentalist mm. ideology to do that. All right. In just the one minute we have left, uh, let me put you on the spot and ask you to predict which country that we haven't been hearing about we're going to start hearing more about now from the region. Jordan. The, Jordan's the big newsmaker. I think it's it's starting to get a lot more a All lot right. more interesting on the ground. All right. Well, I'm sure that's a very complex story and so we'll have you back and you can talk about Jordan with us and uh, help us unravel that one uh, as well as other developing uh, stories in the region. Thanks again as always. Uh, as always I learned a great deal and hope the audience has as well. Join us again for another episode of Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube.